Hello and welcome to this week's Ask an Atheist. My name is Liz Cavell, Associate Counsel for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, I am joined by Patrick Elliott. He is Senior Counsel at FFRF and he is remote from the Twin Cities. Um, we've been having some iffy connections, so um, hopefully he'll hang in there with us. And I'm also joined by Sam Grover. He is also Associate Counsel here at FFRF. And today we're talking about how religion is coming for anti-discrimination laws. We're going to explore some of the legal cases um, that set the stage and share some of our thoughts on what we're likely to see in the years ahead. Um, religious groups are still looking to challenge anti-discrimination laws, and that is um, kind of impending on the current uh, upcoming Supreme Court term. And as always, if you have questions about our topic today, you can drop them in the comments below or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. So Patrick, let's see if we can get you in on this here. The FFRF recently filed a brief in a case that is coming up before the Supreme Court. Um, it involves uh, Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act. So can you give us some background on that lawsuit? Yeah, this is the case that probably nobody's talking about right now, but in a few months, I think a lot of people will be talking about it. And definitely next year when the Supreme Court rules on this case, it's kind of like the Masterpiece Cake Shop case from 2018 that a lot of uh, our viewers are probably familiar with. It involves Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act and somebody for religious reasons who wants to challenge that, who doesn't want to provide goods or services to same, a same-sex couple who's going to be married. Um, so here there's a business owner and a business called 303 Creative that designs uh, websites. And the owner claims she wants to design custom wedding websites. And you, as you can see, this is the proposed design that she would, uh, her proposed website that she would have. And in fact, she wants to put a disclaimer up on the website that would basically say um, uh, that she's going to turn away, you know, customers that are same sex, uh, that, that would be same sex and getting married. Um, we filed a brief before the Supreme Court in this case, and as you can see from some of our quote, you know, what we wrote was, Lori Smith may dislike that loving same-sex couples are afforded the right to marry. Her religious disagreement with marriage equality, however, does not magically transform a speculative chain of events into an imminent injury. Um, and we say that because this really feels like a manufactured case. She's not actually right now um, operating uh, custom wedding website design. Um, this is all set up to challenge the Anti-Discrimination Act and probably to challenge um, gay marriage more generally. Um, since it's been legalized, um, this is what some of the legal groups have been doing is challenging anti-discrimination laws as a way to strike back against legal uh, gay marriage. Um, so she filed suit as a pre-enforcement case, right? This is not, she. there was nobody who, um, was denied service and then filed a complaint. It didn't go through anything in the state. She just filed suit as a pre-enforcement action. And so that's why we said um, in our brief, you know, how this really feels like it's manufactured. It's not a, a business that had been operating. Um, again, we filed that, that brief that really talked about her standing to challenge the law. Um, and then we also got into a little bit of, um, you know, some other areas. So this is our brief, which we were joined with some other organizations, Center for Inquiry, American Humanists, American Atheists, um, supporting the state of Colorado and trying to protect their Anti-Discrimination Act from this legal challenge. Um, and, Patrick, you know, one of the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, before you get into more on what our brief is, you had mentioned Masterpiece Cake Shop, this prior case. Uh, and can you just or maybe I will, uh, remind uh, the viewers what happened in Masterpiece. So in Masterpiece Cake Shop, the Supreme Court was faced with essentially the, the same sort of thing, the same challenge to the Colorado's um, anti-discrimination law. And um, what happened there was the Supreme Court used the, the flimsiest of excuses, this comment made by the Civil Rights Division to essentially say that um, the whole process by which Colorado evaluated Masterpiece Cake Shop's discriminatory practices uh, was based on religious animus. And so instead of deciding whether a business can legitimately discriminate against same-sex couples, the Supreme Court punted on that question. 
Uh, and that's why this 303 Creative case is essentially Masterpiece Cake Shop 2.0, uh, although this time it's solely a free speech challenge rather than a uh, religious freedom challenge. Is that right? Right. Your point, um, it was originally both you know, a free exercise and free speech, but the Supreme Court, our very activist Supreme Court, has just taken the free speech question. And so um, you know, I think all of us as attorneys see where that may go, where that may lead. You know, you'd really have um, a pretty broad right by businesses to discriminate against couples uh, or against people, not just on the basis of sexual orientation, but any number of factors claiming that it's free speech. And so that's why this case is a lot more dangerous than uh, Master Beast Cake Shop, which, as Sam pointed out, was was kind of punted, um, as, as a lot of people or commentators would say. This is a this is a bigger case, I think. It is, and important to point out that what has changed in the years since Masterpiece Cake Shop is the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court. So, um, there is a much stronger conservative majority now um, doing this real activist pro-religious interest uh, work on the court, and so I think that's a big factor in why this case is being taken up when it so clearly mirrors an issue that the court just uh, ruled on in the past five years. Just decided it didn't want to rule on, essentially. Well, yes, yeah. right. Took up the case and then um, resolved without resolving the broader issue, probably because it couldn't get enough votes for um, a ruling on the broader issue. And now I think we're going to probably see um, what we feared in Masterpiece in the 303 case. Um, and one of the other things that our brief, FFRF's amicus brief, talked about was that um, a decision in 303 Creative might actually increase discrimination. So, Patrick, can you explain what you were arguing about um, in the brief on that point? Yeah. You know, one of the things I think when you're writing a brief like this, you're trying to tell the court, hey, you also need to be concerned about something. And here it seems that the court's maybe not as concerned about discrimination against atheists or Muslims or same-sex couples. But one thing they might be concerned about is discrimination against religious people. Um, because if they rule this way in favor of 303 Creative, you could have vast amount of discrimination against religious people, including um, you know, people who are ex-Catholic or, or ex-Mormon and not wanting to provide services to traditional uh, religious weddings. So that's something we pointed out in the brief uh, we wrote about um, you know, the larger trend here. Um, and one of the things that was interesting when we were researching this was, I didn't know this, and I think um, maybe a lot of people have observed this recently. If you've been to a wedding recently, it's, it's probably most likely that it was not either in a church or it didn't have a, a religious officiant. Um, so in the last 10 years, there's been a huge trend um, as you can see, going back to 1982, 72% of weddings said we're in a religious location with a religious officiant. And now it's about 30%. So about 70% of weddings are people are getting married by a friend, a family member, or they're in a non-religious setting. You know, it's an outdoor wedding. So this is a pretty big um, demographic shift that if you're a wedding vendor providing services, the majority of your customers are going to kind of fit into this, this category of not a traditional religious wedding. So the court maybe should be concerned about what if people want to stop providing services to a Mormon wedding or Catholic uh, couple. Um, that's something you know we don't support, but I think the court should really be concerned about it, given the secular trends that are happening in this country. Right. Um, and of course, in right on that graph is all three of our awesome, uh, completely non-religious weddings, which were both um, done without a religious officiant and in a non-religious setting. Um, so uh, I love those statistics, and actually, I'm really surprised by um, how low that number is. Um, but I love it. So what do you think, this is for all of us, what do, you, what do we think is the potential outcome in the 303 case before the court? So Pat, you mentioned this is, um, the court is um, taking up the free speech question. So what do we think the actual outcome will be? Yeah, I think, you know, the fact that they took the case is a terrible sign for, you know, our secular country and for, uh, you know, non-discrimination being protected. So I think it's very likely they'll say, 
you know, designing content for websites is, is pure speech. Therefore, the state of Colorado is discriminating or the state of Colorado, Colorado is violating the free speech rights of the business. So that's the most likely scenario. Um, I have a slight bit of hope that maybe they'll try to kick this case on some other grounds like happened in Masterpiece. But I, I think they want to cue this up for saying it's a free speech violation. Yeah. And I guess what we should do is, is talk about sort of the larger context of uh, past challenges uh, right. to the same idea. Right. Um, so th this uh, this religious freedom argument, this free speech argument uh, where businesses are essentially trying to make the argument to discriminate against marginalized groups is not new. It actually. Um, the, the um, my religion exempts me from the law argument dates all the way back to 1878 uh, when the Supreme Court heard Reynolds v. U.S., a case where there was a religious challenge to an anti-polygamy statute. And the court um, rejected the argument that uh, one's religious beliefs could exempt them from this neutral, generally applicable anti-polygamy law. They said to permit an exemption to the law for religious belief would essentially make uh, each citizen a law unto themselves, and that government could exist in name only under such circumstances. And you see that same sort of challenge continue. Um, there's an a anti-child uh, labor uh, law that gets challenged in, I think, 1944. And then uh, in the civil rights era, you get these challenges uh, where businesses want to discriminate against uh, uh, racial minorities, right? Uh, so you get the, um, the uh, Piggy Park uh, case where um, Maurice Bessinger says that uh, his religious beliefs make it so he can't serve uh, black people at his barbecue joint. Uh, and the Supreme Court has no problem rejecting that argument uh, on the same uh, logic that it uses, uses in Reynolds. Right? Um, no, you can't uh, just exempt yourself from neutral, generally applicable laws based on your religious beliefs. Uh, that's what's at stake here. And uh, make no mistake that there, there's, no, uh, there's no legal or logical distinction between uh, what 303 Creative is challenging in this case and what Maurice Bessinger was challenging in the Piggy Park Enterprises case. Yeah. So, that's not just morally true, that's literally true. So the exact same legal arguments, I mean, you know, put in different, in, you know, 2022 terms, um, an argument is exactly the same sort of legal, actual legal argument being made against um, racial anti-discrimination laws in the, um, civil rights years, so the 1960s. Basically, it is the exact same legal argument being made, and the only difference, if you if you see a difference, is race is somehow different from anti-LGBTQ, anti-discrimination principles, that we somehow feel differently about one versus the other, um, at least this Supreme Court does. Yeah. But there are... Uh organizations out there that will immediately jump on this precedent to once again challenge those anti-discrimination statutes in the context of race. Um, this is not something that has died out in this country, obviously. Right. Uh, Bob Jones University uh, sued in 1983 uh, in order to discriminate, again, on the basis of race uh, in its university setting. Right. right. Um, so there, there are... Um, groups out there that will absolutely want to dis discriminate on the basis of race uh, based on their religious beliefs. Yeah. Um, so, Patrick, you um, flagged when we prepped for this another case that was before the Supreme Court in the term that just passed, and that was Carson versus Macon. Um, the court in that case ruled on um, the main uh, a May, the state of Maine has a public school tuition program for, uh, and we probably talked about this on this show previously, um, the state of Maine doesn't have uh, high schools, secondary schools, in, in many of its rural school districts. So it has a program by which the state um, basically funds individual students' tuition if they live in one of those districts that doesn't have a high school. And the student's family typically can select 
a public school in a neighboring district or a private school that it can send its or that the family can send its student to and the state will pay the school that student's tuition in lieu of providing secondary schools in these districts that don't have enough students to support one. So one of the um, criteria under the law in Maine was that uh, you couldn't pick a sectarian religious school because Maine has a state anti-establishment of religion clause in its state constitution, and it has an interest in not using public funds to fund a sectarian religious school for um, the tuition of individual students. So that has been in place for decades, and the case Carson versus Macon, that was before the court in this past term, was two Christian schools and, well, two families that wanted to send their students to these sectarian Christian schools. Um, that couldn't use the public funding, challenging the whole scheme as a violation of <clears throat> free exercise, the free exercise rights of families and ultimately those schools. The Supreme Court ruled in favor, of course, of the religious interest, and the um, court said that uh, the the main tuition program could not refuse to to provide tuition reimbursements to religious schools just on the basis of their religion. Left it for another day to be decided whether or not um, that funding could be, uh, other uh, requir state requirements could be attached to that funding. So in other words, um, schools under the um, main tuition reimbursement program have to provide what's comparable to a public school education. So there are curricular standards and of course, and apropos of our conversation today, there are anti-discrimination standards that have to be followed just like public schools. Schools can't discriminate against disabled kids. They have to um, provide an open and kind of welcoming education for students without regard to uh, race, and there are all kinds of anti-discrimination provisions that would apply to these schools. Um, the Supreme Court didn't have to deal with whether or not schools have a religious right to participate in the program without those strings attached. Um, so, of course, Maine, the state of Maine, continues to require schools in the program to abide by anti-discrimination practices. So um, we're talking today about, like, how does this all fit into uh, this future where the Supreme Court allows religious exemption from anti-discrimination laws? Yeah, and, and so that case was just decided, I think, June 21st. So this is a very recent um, decision. And Liz, I, I think you could probably also comment on, you know, there's been an update. You know, what were these schools actually going to participate in the program now that the court has said it should? Um, and so we have an article from just last week from the Associated Press saying religious schools shun state funding despite main victory. So I think there was maybe only one school right now that indicated it wants to participate, one religious school that has indicated it wants to participate in the, the funding program because specifically they can't discriminate against students or teachers on the basis of sexual orientation. So I think that kind of tells you, um, you know, what the priorities of these schools are, whether they want to provide an education to all students or is it more important for them to, you know, deny a, a job to a teacher or a, an education to a student on the basis of sexual orientation. So we kind of have our answer. You know, this has only been just over two months since the Supreme Court issued that decision, and we now have this update. We don't know what it will look like next year, but we kind of know what the what the education is going to look like for this year. Right. And I mean, in the in that AP article that we just clipped the headline from, there's the plaintiffs being quoted in the article. And the plaintiffs if, were um, parents of students that they wanted to send to these conservative Christian schools. And the plaintiffs are complaining, like, you know, this is so messed up. Like, the Supreme Court said we get the money, but, you know, there's all these strings attached to the money. And it's just this it's this never ending march to like have their cake and eat it too as these you know preferred religious actors in society it's like it's not enough to say you get public funding to go to a sectarian religious school they they expect to be able to have public funding to support their religious schools that also actively discriminate in their employment practices and against students 
Uh, and that is, of course, not a veiled preview, like a explicit preview of the next frontier of litigation in this area, right? Yeah. I mean, do we expect legal challenges to this main law now that's still limiting the funding to schools that don't discriminate? I mean, do we actually expect that these schools will just say, OK, we got what we wanted? No, I, they're, they're going to challenge these additional restrictions on receiving the funds, the anti-discrimination restrictions. And uh, all, all signs point to the Supreme Court uh, wanting to side with these religious schools at all costs, whether it's for principled reasons or not. Right, and it's the same argument. It's like, we have a free exercise right not only to receive public funding, just like public schools, but we have a religious right to do so in a way that comports with our conservative Christian beliefs, which include discrimination against uh, you know, gay and transgender students and staff. So I'm, I think that's the really like scary possibility for what's coming up in this Supreme Court term. You know, this past term was such a like just crime against humanity in so many different areas of law. But it's important to know that the Supreme Court has already taken on cases for this upcoming term that are just going to continue to extend this really radical trend of privileging religion at the expense of the rights of everyone else, especially LGBTQ um, citizens and even students. Yeah, and I think what you're what you're highlighting, Liz, is something you know FFRF has been saying for years. Is this is kind of the one-two punch? Is first they fight to say we can't be excluded from the program, and then secondly they get to dictate the terms that they'll comply with in any program. Um, so we saw that with foster care, um, foster care agency uh, that the Supreme Court took their case against the city of Philadelphia, saying that they, um, you know, couldn't be regulated by the city's terms of foster care. Um, and now we're seeing it. I think we're going to see it with schools. You know, that will be the next frontier. Is do schools get to opt out of the Human Rights Act in Maine or in other states that would require them not to discriminate either against students or, or faculty and staff? Um, that's kind of the next um, step. I, maybe that's why we have this title is that religion's coming for it, because we don't yet have those those rulings against us. But that's where the direction of everything seems to be going. Yeah. Right. So I am going to pause to take a um, question, a viewer question, and uh, we can kind of talk about this amongst ourselves. So this is a question uh, from Jason. Is there a chance that the main decision will spread to other states with similar, similar or comparable programs. And I know, um, Pat, you can talk about school choice and how widespread that is and how this the Carson versus Macon decision um, kind of affects the landscape on, on public education. Yeah, I think, you know, Maine was really unique in that it wasn't actually offering secondary schools. And, and it was a large number of districts, maybe like half the districts. Thankfully, in the rest of the country, there's, act there's for the most part, public schools available to people. And so this is a little bit different than, I think, the normal voucher schemes that other states have adopted. But the concern is certainly there in that um, if there's some type of funding available for education, we may start to see other challenges by religious schools to say, hey, we're also entitled to that funding. Um, and so it's a concern. We don't really know how that's going to play out in other states. Um, there are other challenges that have been pending in some states. So we're just going to have to see what the impact will be. Um, I'm hopeful that if states require, you know, voucher programs uh, to have non-discrimination protections, that those would be upheld by courts. Um, if a school says it wants funds, but it wants to discriminate, I'm hoping that they can be excluded. Um, that's an open question because of this Supreme Court. I don't think it would be as open if if we had a, a court that wasn't um, as interested in, in ruling that way. Yeah, I think it's also what's really scary, besides just the open questions of law that haven't yet been addressed by the Supreme Court, is the fact that we've seen in the, the past term that this court is... Uh, besides just the radical ideology of this court, is the court's willingness to completely depart from stare decisis, which means it, it's not really considering itself 
particularly bound by past decisions of the Supreme Court. So even where we have settled questions or questions that have been addressed by the Supreme Court um, in regards to, like Sam was mentioning, uh, striking down religious arguments for um, non-compliance with anti-discrimination laws, right? There's nothing new under the sun about these art free exercise arguments against civil rights laws, but there's really no solace in the fact that the Supreme Court has addressed some of these questions in the past because the Supreme Court that sits now does not seem particularly bound by precedent. As we saw with Dobbs, it overruled Roe versus Wade because it disagrees. It's overruled a lot of questions in um, our area of law that have been um, the settled law of the land on the separation of church and state. Um, so that's something that's, I think, particularly scary when we go into this term thinking, what is this court going to do to our like long cherished anti-discrimination and civil rights laws? Yeah, the, the court has demonstrated that it's uh, entirely results oriented and unprincipled in how it gets to that result. Uh, the court is far more interested in ensuring that uh, evangelical Christian nationalist interests win out than it is with uh, adhering to uh, principled legal analysis that the court has relied on for decades. So one more thing. Um, while I wait for um, more audience questions to load. Patrick, do we know, or Sam, when we would expect um, 303 to be argued and when we can expect some more kind of um, previewing of what the court's thinking in this case once they hear or oral arguments? Yeah, it's not scheduled yet, but most likely it will be argued in December. There's a few argument sessions available in December. And then the decision will come next year. Um, but I think once uh, the public hears some of the argument, I think our eyes will be opened or people's eyes will be opened to, oh, wow, this is what the court's thinking. And Liz and Sam, maybe you can comment on this, but I was a little frustrated in the past in listening to some of the Supreme Court's arguments because it, sometimes they rehash, I, th I thought, what were settled questions of why do we have civil rights laws? For instance, I think it was Justice Kavanaugh, but maybe it was another justice kind of asking in uh, one of the prior cases, which might have been the, the foster care case, well, isn't it okay if you could go somewhere else? You know, um, you, know you could be denied uh, based on your protected class, whether that's your sexual orientation, your race, uh, but if you could go somewhere else to get the same service, really, what's the harm? Um, and that, I really was bothered by that, coming from a Supreme Court justice. Granted, he's asking a question, he's not saying this is what he thinks, but you're only really asking that if you think that there might be some validity to that position. So I don't know what, Liz, I know you've written on this in the past, but kind of what your take is on, is this, oh, can you get this somewhere 100%, else? hundred percent. And I think it's very generous of you to say, maybe he's just playing devil's advocate. This might not be what he actually thinks. I think there is a very radical ideology on the court about, like you said, the whole premise, the whole moral premise undergirding our um, civil rights laws. And we were arguing this way back when we wrote the Masterpiece Cake Shop amicus brief, which is to, to like harken back to uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and all of those early arguments that were being made to explain to the public why we need this level of consistency across the land when it comes to services in public places, places of public accommodations. And the the harm is the the shame of being turned away and knowing that you could be turned away it's not it's not about the harm is not that i couldn't get a hamburger in you know selma the harm is that i endure the second class citizen status and the humiliation that comes with that as an american citizen that's something that we have decided is a moral principle that we want enshrined in our laws, that if you want to do business in, the, in this case, the state of Colorado or in every jurisdiction in the United States has some sort of state um, civil rights laws it, um, in addition to the Federal Civil Rights Act. And if you want to do business in those places as a place open to the public, then you have to abide by these certain anti-discrimination principles. And it's very simple and it's very uniform. And that's because the harm is in the 
the status, the second class citizen status that it confers upon people in those groups. It's not about access to restaurants and hotels. It's about more than that. Hmm. And what is it about Brett Kavanaugh's upbringing that doesn't prepare him to understand <laughs> those arguments, Liz? <laughs> I don't know. He's usually um, really empathetic, and his life experience has really, um, you know, taught him what it means to be in second class <laughs> citizen uh, groups. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Patrick, I don't know if you had anything else to add on that, but I think we're out of our viewer questions. So, if yeah, not. Well, I just, <laughs> I was just going to mention, you know, and Liz, I think you actually wrote this brief. So, this is back to our masterpiece brief, quoting in part from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And he talks about um, his daughter. I think he says that, you know, tears were swelling up in his daughter's eyes when she saw a commercial for Fun World, like an amusement park that she knew she couldn't go to. You know, I think that's getting at what you're talking about, which is this this feeling that people get. Nobody needs to go to an amusement park. It's not fulfilling your basic needs of survival. Um, you know, you maybe there's other places you could go, but I think that that whole that these concepts are completely lost on our justices of the Supreme Court and that's frustrating that you're pointing it out in a brief. We've been talking about, you know, what is part of the purpose of these laws um and they don't they seem to think, well, you should just be able to go somewhere else. And like that, I think, is a very offensive and 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 immoral position to take that people need to go and not know if they go to a wedding vendor. Are these people going to turn me away because I, we're the wrong type of couple for them or I'm the wrong person for them based on some um, protected class? So I think that's being missed. And so um, that was frustrating to hear. In the prior Oh my gosh, we're losing you, Patrick, but I love seeing you in slow motion like this. So I will say that you can cut, Patrick. Sorry, Pat. We love you. Um, and he made such a good point because uh, I, I do remember, we, and we quoted Martin Luther King Jr. in the Masterpiece Cake Shop brief, um, and I got chills just hearing Patrick like paraphrase what he said, which was talking about his daughter and seeing like dark clouds forming in her eyes when as she understood her inferior status um, in not being able to go to Fun World like other kids. And that just really captures what the harm is of having this system of you know, patchwork anti-discrimination laws across the United States. And you know, we, we decided like as a nation in the civil rights era that that was not good enough for America, and now we're revisiting all of this, and um, it's it's yeah. upsetting. Yeah, and the court's just willing to upturn all of that now. Yeah. Um, so uh, one question we often get when we're talking about this is, okay, I understand that the Supreme Court is terrible now, uh, but what can we do about it, right? Um, and uh, Trump has had the unprecedented uh, ability to appoint three Supreme Court justices during one term. Uh, the court is is firmly uh, uh, taken over, right, uh, for uh, these Christian nationalist interests. Um, what can we as as citizens do about that? Um, the short answer is. Not much, but uh, the, the one the one thing that um, that we can potentially do is uh, is look at court reform, right? Um, the entire uh, federal judiciary is uh, completely overworked right now uh, and uh, needs to be expanded uh, just in order to function normally at all, right? Right, uh, and so uh, as part of that, you can also add seats to the Supreme Court, uh, which probably should happen anyway. Um, there's nothing magical about the, the nine seats on the court that we have now. Uh, the number of seats on the court has ranged uh, from, God, I don't even know, um, from five-ish to 11 right. uh, over time. And uh, uh, the right now, the um, uh, what is it? The Judiciary Act of 2021 uh, is currently uh, 
uh, in Congress. Uh, it, it, was, it passed the House. It's before the Senate right now. It would add four seats to the Supreme Court, uh, as well as um, adding in some, uh, some ethical regulations uh, that the justices would have to abide by. Right now, they have zero uh, rules of professional conduct or judicial ethics that constrain their behavior. So, just right. it's all norms right now, right? Like the the justices have always operated under some principles, like that they remain apolitical while they're on the bench. That they LOL. not that they not <laughs> talk. Yeah, that they not um, discuss cases that are likely to come before the court. Um, you know, publicly discuss them before hearing them. Uh, but those are just norms. Uh, so uh, the Judiciary Act of 2021 would codify some of those um, norms, uh, because as we've seen, Christian nationalists are willing to depart with any norm that uh, doesn't advantage them. Right. So that would make norms into rules and make them actually enforceable in some way. Right. Um, I just wanted to jump in when you were talking about like what can we do and what you're describing right now is all legislative checks on the judiciary. And I think if you, I'm going to combine this with a shameless plug for the We Dissent podcast, which uh, I am a co-host of along with Rebecca Marker and two other fabulous women in the movement. Um, Monica Miller and Allison Gill. But what if you listen to that podcast, then you hear me beating this drum all the time, which is that the judiciary is not like some super branch of government that is just above it all. They are a co-equal branch of government subject to the checks and balances that are inherent in the American constitutional order, which means if they are out of whack with what we as Americans want, we have our representatives in Congress that have the ability to exert checks on their power. Um, and Sam is describing some of those checks, the number of justices that sit on that court, um, the number of justices and their caseloads, all the administrative stuff that makes the lower federal courts run smoothly is what Sam is also talking about, which is there aren't enough judges as an administrative matter. There are too many cases, not enough judges. All of that is set by Congress, and it should be expanded long ago for administrative reasons. It would also have the added benefit of making the judiciary fairer and putting checks on the power of the judiciary as it exists now. Um, also, rules of ethical um, judicial ethics and ethical conduct, that is a check that Congress can exert on the judiciary that is perfectly within our constitutional order. There is nothing like radical about this. I'm very tired of this being considered a really radical proposal that departs from, you know, everything that's ever happened in America and our framers would blah, blah, blah. Like, this is a very valid constitutional exercise of power in terms of checks and balances. And that is something that we can ask our Congress people, they are our representatives and they work for us to do um, because we see that as a priority because this court is going, is already arriving at a place that we don't want and we're not powerless. Right. Um, so there's one more question about anti-discrimination laws and it comes up kind of a lot um, when I used to do some of the letters that would uh, arise from public accommodations dispute. So I'm going to put it out there and then we'll wrap up. Um, someone asked in the comments, what about signs in a public place that say, uh, we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone? And we used to get this from, mm. <clears throat> from businesses saying, um, well, I can offer like special pricing to veterans and I can offer offer special pricing to, you know, Packers fans. Like how come I can't offer special pricing to Christians and, and people that go to worship services? And how do we answer that question? Yeah. Like what is the difference between I can refuse service to anyone, which is true to a point, like what does that mean and how does it fit in with civil rights laws? Oh my God, which Supreme Court justice was it who specifically talked about Packers fans? Like That uh, just happened. I know. Oral that's, argument. I'm sorry to trigger you. But the, yeah, no, but <laughs> I mean, the, the short answer is the Constitution uh, doesn't. Alito. It, it, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, there, there are no special protections in the Constitution for Packers fans or some of these other uh, classes so that you, you can um, provide special benefits uh, for certain types certain segments of the population. But you're not allowed to do that same thing 
uh, based on race or sex or sexual orientation. Um, that's what we've codified because as a country, uh, we care about making sure that those immutable characteristics do not grant you special privileges or uh, demote you to second class status. Right. So what those signs mean is we as a business owner do have the right to refuse service to anyone in parentheses except on the basis of you know race, ethnicity, and depending on the state you live in sexual orientation, sex, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that doesn't make for a great sign in the door, but it basically means w you do have a ton of freedom as a business owner to conduct your business as you see fit, but you are subject to some laws, and not just anti-discrimination laws like food safety laws and OSHA and all this other stuff that businesses happily comply with for, you know, the price of being in the marketplace. And that's what civil rights laws are as well. Um, so I don't know, Patrick, if you ever made it back from the land of slow motion frozenness, but... Hey, Patrick. Um, so we just asked our last question. You missed it. Um, but I'm glad you're back so that we can say thank you so much for calling in and talking about this topic with us. And I think if no one else has any final words of wisdom, that will conclude Ask an Atheist for this week. Yeah. Bye, Patrick. Thanks for hosting, Les. Hey. <laughs> Always, thanks for joining us uh, if you're out there watching. And be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. This week, our guest is eminent constitutional attorney Jeffrey Stone. Here's a little preview. I was a, a, a law clerk to Justice Brennan in the year that Roe was decided. So I was there. You know, what was interesting about it is that uh, five of the six Republican appointed justices, including three of the four justices appointed by Richard Nixon, uh, voted in support of uh, Roe v. Wade and the right of women to terminate unwanted pregnancies. Um, that shows how non-political the decision was at the time. Indeed, in the years since Roe, um, including the justices in Roe, um, nine of the 11 justices not sitting on the court today, nine of the 11 justices not on the court today, um, who were Republican appointed, voted to uphold Roe v. Wade. So the court we have today is uh, completely different from anyone we've had in the last 50 years, including among Republican appointed justices. You can watch Free Thought Matters on TV stations around the US on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. And also check out Free Thought Radio. That's our weekly radio show and podcast. And you can find out where to hear Free Thought Radio at ffrf.org slash radio. If you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. We will see you next time on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.